Hi, I'm Justin Hensley. I'm a senior member of technical staff in AMD's office at the CTO, where I work on advanced technology initiatives. Today, we're going to be talking about OpenCLC and how you program with it, some of the language features and the built-in functions. Um, so the OpenCLC language is actually quite verbose, and I won't have time to actually go into all the details in this presentation. Uh, I highly recommend you to go to the Kronos website and download the spec if you're interested in knowing all the details of the OpenCLC language. So the OpenCLC language is based off of ISO C99, but there are a couple of restrictions from C99. So the, the, the major restrictions are there are no standard C99 headers, there are no function pointers, no recursion, no variable length arrays, and no bit fields. There are actually some additions to OpenCLC though, uh, and these additions were made to help out with parallelism. So the first thing is that there are work item functions and, and work group functions that are used to, to, um, when you're writing your application so you know what work item you are and what work group you're using and very information about the system. And those are, are built in intrinsics in the language now. There are also explicit vector types, and then there's functions for handling synchronization. So those keywords are, have been added to the language. There's also address space qualifiers. One of the things about OpenCL is that we have these different address spaces to allow you to share memory between work groups and also use the best memory for the job so that you can actually write very efficient parallel code. And because of that, we have to have these special memory space qualifiers. And we also have optimized image access because we know that we're going to be running on hardware that has special purpose uh, units designed to deal with images, so we might as well use them. There are also built-in functions for accessing data about the current runtime that we're running on. So let's look at our kernel real quick. So this is a very simple data parallel kernel that's going to square uh, a value. So it's going to read a value from some array named input, multiply it times itself, and then write it to uh, the output array. So let's look at how this looks a little bit more. Let's say we have an input vector here uh, with, that's shown at the bottom of the screen. And let's say we call get global ID for zero. So we're calling it for the zeroth dimension. Because remember, we could have a one dimensional, two dimensional, or three dimensional domain. So here we're calling get global ID with zero. So we want to know for the zeroth dimension. And let's say it gives us back that our position is equal to 11. So that points to uh, the position in the output or input array that's shown. We'll read a value from the input array. And it just so happens that value is six. We're going to multiply that value six times six and that gives us 36. So we'll write that to the output, uh, which you know it seems pretty simple. But the, the neat thing about OpenCL is that this is a data parallel language. So you have to think of it that every single one of the input has a work item associated with it. So instead of just doing one item at a time, we're actually going to just do all the items at a time in parallel because they're completely independent. OK, let's look at some of the work item and work group functions. So let's say we have the uh, input buffer. So one of the work item functions you might be interested in is get work dimension. So that's going to tell us, are we in a 1D, 2D, or 3D uh, space that we're doing our work? In this case, we just have a one-dimensional vector. So when we call get work dimension, we're going to get one, because that's how many dimensions of work that we're working on. The next thing we might call is, what's the size? Get the global size of the, the work. So in this case, we're going to get 26, because this tells us there are 26 work items in our global size. So the next thing we might want to find out is, what's the local size? In this case, when we launched this kernel, we determined that the local size was 13. Um, and so the local size is 13. That means our work group has 13 elements in it. So if our global size has 26 elements, our local size has 13 elements, that means that we have two groups. And so if we made get num groups, that would tell us that we have two groups. For the highlighted work, element, or work item on the left, if we called the function get group ID, that would be zero because this is the zeroth work group. If we called the same function on the right work group, we would get work group ID of one because it's the one work group. Let's look at some of the other functions you can call. Let's say for a different highlighted work item, the one that's highlighted now, we actually called get local ID. So the local ID is eight. If we called get global ID, that would give us a global ID of 21. And so the, you know, at first this might seem strange that we have two addresses, but because we have a global size and a local size, we'd need to have an address in the global space and in the local space. And by using this local address, we can actually use our local memory to share data between data that's in the work, uh, same work group. But remember, you cannot share data in local memory between work groups. It's only within a work group. So let's look at some of the different data types we can talk about. So there are scalar data types, and those have you know, the very obvious types that we think of, such as int, short, long, u long. Uh, other types. There's also a half type, but that's really for storage and not necessarily for processing. There are also the image types. So you have image 2D, image 3D, and sampler. So those are uh, the actual data for storing uh, data into an image and also sampling it from an image. And then there are also vector types. 
So let's look at some of these vector types in more detail. So they, they're designed to be portable, so no matter what runtime you're running on, you know that if you use a certain vector type, it'll be portable across these different runtimes. And OpenCL requires that the vector types have certain characteristics. So the vector links that you can have are 2, 4, 8, and 16. One of the important things about the data types is they're Indian safe, so that you know if you write code using these vectors, that if you go between the GPU, the CPU, or some DSP, you know that they're Indian safe and that the same code will work and you don't have to worry about doing Indian conversions. And they are aligned at vector length, so you know that the alignment and the Indian of these different vector types. And the vector operations have built-in functions, so these are guaranteed with the OpenCL 1.0 runtime that the 1.0 uh, functions have to be there. Of course, there are extensions that can be done and that you have to check for your runtime. So let's look at some of these vector operations. Let's say we want to create a vector literal. So we basically want to create a vector from uh, a literal type. So in this case, we're going to have two vectors, one named vi0 and the other one vi1. In the first case, we're creating it from a single literal negative 7. In the second case, we're actually giving it explicit components for uh, each of the four components of the vector type. So in memory, we would have negative 7, negative 7, negative 7, negative 7. So if we look at the next one, we're actually creating this explicitly from four different components, because this is a four-component vector. So in this case, we have 0, 1, 2, and 3. So we have two different vectors here, each storing two different uh, sets of data. So let's look at some of the things you can do with vectors. So one of the nice things about vectors is that you can select their components. And so um, OpenSeal has a very verbose set of vector component selects. I'm only going to go over a couple of them. And again, I would highly recommend going to uh, the spec if you want to see some of the uh, more advanced ones. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to say one vector's low component will be equal to another vector's high component. And so we do that by doing dot low. So we select, we say the dot low component of vi0 will be equal to the high component of vi1. And so at the end of that, we're going to have the vector with the shown uh, values in it. You can also use some more advanced uh, vector component selects, such as dot odd. And what that'll do is that'll give us all the odd components of the vector. And there's also an equivalent dot even, which will give you all the even components of a vector. There is also a select routine. So you can say select 0, 1, which will give you the 0 and 1 uh, components of a vector. Again, I highly recommend that you go to the spec to see all the different variations on the different vector component selects that you can do. So there's also vector mathematical operations. So in this case, we're going to demonstrate how you can do the plus equals operator. So in this case, we have vi0 plus equals vi1. So in this case, we're going to take 2, 3, negative 7, negative 7, which is our first vector type, and add to it 0, 1, 2, 3, our second vector. So at the end, what we're going to be storing in the resultant vi0 will be 2, 4, negative 5, and 4. So we've just taken vi0 added to it vi1 and stored it back into vi0. So that's one example of a mathematical operation. Another one is that we could do the absolute value, and then the resultant vector would be 2, 4, 5, 4. Uh, again, there's a, a very verbose set of arithmetic operations that you can do, and I won't go through them here, and I recommend that you go to the spec to see all of them.